that coming through? Yeah, okay, good. Uh, Imad is gonna do a little demo, so he's got his computer set up. We've been talking an awful lot at this conference about AI from every possible angle and dimension, but here you have sitting in front of you one of the major people doing it in the world. Um, Stability AI, which Imad started not very long ago, four, four years ago, a little over four years ago. Um, as you'll see, we're, we're gonna slide up in a minute showing uh, downloads. It's extraordinarily successful. It's in extraordinarily ambitious. And he makes some extraordinary claims, as you will see, and they're quite impressive. And a lot of the things that he's attempted to do, he has succeeded in doing in the past. Um, this morning, I saw Azim Azar, who did a great interview with Imad um, for his video series earlier, uh, a few months ago. And, um, you know, I was talking to him about this amazing young man, uh, partly because there's been a lot of controversy around him. Forbes wrote a real attack piece on him, uh, criticizing him of many, many fabrications of his resume, et cetera, almost all of which kind of got swept away over time. And I, I, I said to Azim, you know, so what do you think? He said, I think he's actually accomplishing a lot more than he's getting credit for. And Azim probably knows more about AI than I do, so I just am quoting him for convenience there. But maybe we should start, Imad, by you just talking quickly, what is Stability AI and what is your goal as a company? Uh, thank you, yeah, thank you for being here. It's uh, always wonderful to be in Munich. Um, I set up Stability because uh, the first two years of Stability were working on COVID research, a lot of pro bono things, and then we couldn't get access to a lot of this technology like GPT-3 and others. It really started as a non-profit. It started effective. as a non-profit. Yeah. So two years ago, we had no researchers and no engineers. Two years ago. Two years ago, yeah. Um, because again, we were doing some of this work as kind of grants, working on a non-profit, and then we were like, this technology is powerful, but what if you can't control it? What if you can't customize it? Who decides it? So the goal of stability was to have good quality models of every type that you could take and own and adapt to your own needs. So open, open, open source. Yeah, that's yeah. a big differentiator here is everything he does is open source. <laughs> Okay, yeah, I like that. Okay, like that. Yeah. that's a good stuff. Okay. Yeah, and then um, you know, one of the biggest things here was um, actually stable diffusion coming out of LMU. Bjorn led the team of Robin, Patrick, Andreas, and Dominic, who lead our team in Freiburg, um, kind of pushing the boundaries of visual technology. So you're kind of operating stable diffusion, even though you didn't technically invent it. Yeah, the team yeah. that invented yeah. it under the incredible tutelage of Bjorn did that, and we've done that with teams across modalities. So now we have the best, one of the best 3D models award-winning music model, time innovation of the year, video model that's world-class, language, everything. And the idea is these models are the building blocks that every single organization and business and media is going to be built upon, which is kind of crazy, and it's here right now. And you believe that by doing it in open source, there's tremendous fundamental advantages in terms of the adaptability of the software, its ability to spread more widely, uh, and we'll get into some of that. Uh, behind us, we have a little data. I, I, where does this come from? Oh, Hugging Face, right? Yep. Just quickly describe what we're seeing here. Yeah, so Hugging Face is the GitHub for developers for AI. So it's where all the AI developers go. So now, this is as of November of last year, more people downloaded our models in November than any other company. And we're the most liked company by developers on Hugging Face as well. That's 49.8 million downloads in the month of November. Uh, and I don't know, what is it, 20.3 thousand, thousand likes, likes by, de by developers. Yeah. Okay, that's pretty impressive. Now, you're going to show us a little bit of it's something, right? Demo, okay. Yeah, Yeah. please do. So I think, you know, when this technology first came out, it was a bit magic. You can make, you can write, you can kind of do all these things, and we'll talk a bit about it. Uh, if we can kind of switch to this. One of the things is, where does it kind of all stop, and where is the future? So this is a model called SDXL Turbo that the team out of Freiburg, uh, Robin's team, kind of did. And one of the key things is, how fast does it go? So if you kind of wanted to generate this before, it would have taken a minute to do this. We can now do in a hat in Munich with a beer at a conference. <laughs> Oil painting, right? And so, you know, this... That's very now, fast. It's very fast. We can now do on a consumer GPU 100 images per second. 
And so this is kind of the breakthrough of SDXL kind of turbo. And again, the quality is just there. Like, you know, I'm going to try again live. David, over to you. You want to try something? Oh, I was going to say the Empire State Building uh, on its side. Oh, that's going to be a complex one. Can though. you do that? Let's try Empire State Building. On its side. On its side. I don't think it's going to figure out the functionality. Oh, can't do it? OK. Alas. On an island? It's already on an island. Uh, try surrounded it. by knights. How about that? By knights. Oh, that's, uh, that's uh, kind of. Yeah, we can do it. It's a ballpark. Okay. It's that's ballpark. Good. Again, like, you know, this technology is I research. like the image, actually. Yeah, we can uh, do it as a stack. I wish Manhattan movie. looked like that. That's where How's I live. Um, right? but, but it's super fast. I mean, the point, I think you're, one of your central beliefs is that, you know, we are moving into a fundamentally new age for creation, right? Talk about that. Yeah, so I think that the previous internet reduced the cost of distribution, but now the cost of creation of information of media is going down dramatically and the quality is going up, so it lifts the floor for everyone. So this model runs on your iPhone one image a second right now, but now we have video models coming that are real time, speech that's real time. Jensen Huang at NVIDIA said every pixel will be generated. So you go from streaming content to streaming creation of content. And that's this year, that's next year. And it doesn't require giant supercomputers. You know, again, you can run this on an iPhone, you can run it on a MacBook. You need supercomputers to train the models, yeah. but you don't need supercomputers to run it, which is in contrast to, say, OpenAI, right? Yeah, I think the focus of OpenAI and a lot of these other labs are artificial general intelligence. AI, they could do everything. Whereas we were like amplified human intelligence, give people models that allow them to create more, tell better stories, and focus on the distribution of the edge and open to optimize it. When our video model came out at the end of last year, it took 40 gigabytes of graphics card memory, so that's beyond a consumer graphics card. One week later, the community had taken it down to six. Because it's open source because and you have all um, these people working on it. Yeah, because they're like, let's take it, let's optimize it, let's figure out new things. You have so many more brains working on it. Yeah, so I mean, we hear so much about open AI. Just how would you, how should we think about stability compared to them? I think the best example and mental model I have for this technology is it's like a very enthusiastic graduate. So that's like, you know, it can draw, it can write, it can code, it can do all these things. And proprietary model companies like OpenAI and others, they do wonderful work, and you know, I use it myself, but it's like having a consultant versus your own graduate. The supercomputers are like universities, you know, and how it will impact you, your life, and everything. And how you use it is, do you have, what would you do if you had infinite graduates? So it's idea, your idea is that everyone can get access to an unlimited number of enthusiastic graduates to help them do anything, more or less. Yeah. Which be, and, and, and you believe that will extend even to really the entire planet, which open source in particular will enable. So talk a little bit about that. Yeah, so I think open source, you see the innovation, you see the optimization, wonderful companies like Mistral and you know, Meta have done releases kind of pushing the boundaries. And I think what happens is you will use open source for your private data and models that push for you, and then you will also use these proprietary models for more specialist things. And it will be both. It isn't an either or, and then they will keep accelerating each other. But there's a point where it gets good enough and fast enough, like that's good enough, that image generation for the first pass of anything, and it's 100 images a second. We're now at GPT 3.5 level on a smartphone without internet. I think we'll hit GPT 4 on a smartphone in a year or so. How much better do you need than you that? You mean all processing on the phone? On the phone. No supercomputer chips, none of this. We can already do G chat GPT level on a smartphone. And I don't think people realize good enough, fast enough, cheap enough occurring because of this open innovation plus this kind of race that's occurring and the impact it will have upon society. You actually think that everyone is going to have their own individuated, personally trained AI, right? Or you think that's a possibility? Yeah, I think it's like infrastructure, right? So you have your own iPhone account with all of your settings. It will also have all your knowledge. Like, I think in a few years, you'll be having this conversation. It'll be automatically added to your Memex, and it will surface information relevant to you, but private to you, because you don't want to send your private information elsewhere. But sometimes you might need specialist stuff, and so then you do send some private information elsewhere, just like you talk to a specialist, you know? And again, I think it'll be a combination of these design patterns. So what, what would you say is motivating you at the core right now? What is it you're trying to accomplish in the most macro sense? 
I want to, like, intelligence is this kind of bell curve and it's evenly distributed, but opportunity isn't. So I used to be an emerging markets hedge fund manager. 10% of our company's equity is for education for kids in emerging markets. You know, we've been deploying tablets for our char uh, charity. You've given 10% of your company's equity to a nonprofit. Yes, imagine that a is a work. very high percentage, by the way. Yeah, Im imagine. Uh, yeah. uh, Imagine Worldwide is, my, is our charity run by my co-founder, Joe Wolf, and it deploys tablets into refugee camps that teach 76% of kids literacy and numeracy in 13 months on one hour a day. So now that's scaling to whole nations across uh, Africa and beyond. And imagine what would happen if you put GPT-4 and these image models in the hands of every single child in a nation, and it taught you and learned from you. Are you visual? Are you auditory? You know, do you have dyslexia and adapted? We have an opportunity to give unprecedented education, healthcare, others that are personalized to each individual and child. And I think that's why we build these models, because we view them as the building blocks for the next step in information infrastructure. You don't have to go to the top places to get knowledge that should be accessible to all. Just like the previous talk, cancer, we should have all the cancer knowledge at our fingertips, right? And the empathy, we should have chatbots that go with us through that journey when we've been diagnosed with cancer or Alzheimer's or any of these things. And it should be public goods. Every nation will have their own models. Governments will run on open. You can't run on black boxes. And so again, I think, really think of it like infrastructure. 5G, but for information, for knowledge, I think. And again, being open source, you believe, enables that all to happen much more rapidly and, and much more fairly, in a sense. Directly, because there's always this question of not made here. I have a powerful technology. Obviously, if you don't have a goal of educating every child and others, you minimize for regret. You don't take a step on a journey when you don't know where you're going, right? And so a lot of the big companies said, this technology is too powerful, let's stop releasing it, because what if people like us don't have it? And some of them are bad actors, some of them are good actors. But the world's infrastructure, from cryptography to servers, Linux, is run on open. It's more resilient. And again, this is technology that, again, our view might be different to China's view. Our view might be different to Botswana's view. Do they deserve this technology? Should they have it? I think it's a reasonable thing they should, because it lifts all boats. Well, you mentioned China. In, in the United States in particular, the idea that we are, quote, ahead of China in AI is a very proudly uh, proclaimed and, and, and preciously guarded, they hope, by restricting NVIDIA exports and a lot of other things. Um, do you think that's going to work? No. Why not? I think large computers being the substitute for bad data what we're doing right now is like holding the language models with the eyes open and we train them on the whole of YouTube. I mean, how many of you allow your children to watch YouTube? You know, it's terrible, like all these weird generated things. And then we tune it back to being human. Data is key and you see in Microsoft's 5.2 paper, DALI 3 train on entirely synthetic data that's good quality. And China has the ability to create more data than anyone. We're already seeing Chinese open models match GPT-4. It's likely that adversaries have downloaded the weights of these technologies anyway. And so I think the supercompute thing is a canard that will last a new few more years because you still use the big compute to make up for bad ingredients, like you cook a steak for longer and it gets more tender. Mm. But then we'll have better data sets, we'll have national data sets. And I think that then means a democratization where it's not about the supercomputers, it's about the talent, it's about the structured thinking, and it's about how do you build these things. So you don't think that open sourcing powerful AIs like the ones you're building will empower China to move more quickly in a way that could hurt the West. Aside that is something widely said in the United States. Aside from us, the leader in open models is China. So again, they have open language models that are matching GPT-4, some of the best video models, image models. It's only us and China kind of doing that. And companies will use those reflecting Chinese values instead of anyone else's if no one other else is available. That's one of the reasons we build this. OK, what a, let's just touch on a another one of the hot button issues, jobs. Mm. When you think about what you know and what you're trying to accomplish and all the things that we do to make a living in society today, how do you think that's gonna change? Well, I think again, on supply demand basis, if you have infinite graduates and knowledge available to you, that's clearly gonna cause massive graduate unemployment in science and STEM and coding. I've gone on record and saying last year there are no more coding jobs as we know it in five years because AI can talk to computers better than humans. So I think that governments have to build national open models, open data sets, um, like regulatory sandboxes to drive innovation and the jobs of the future embracing this technology. Just like 
if you have a child and he's competing against another child that's using this natively, the other child will outcompete. Just like if you have a company, AI is not going to replace your job. Other people using AI will. And so that's why we need to create more AI-first jobs. And I think, again, this is... But you is, believe a lot of those can be created? I think they can, because you can solve so many problems due to the richer context of all this information by giving people the superpowers to write amazing stuff, create amazing stuff. And I think that lifts all boats. But it's going to be tough. This what, is going why far. will it be tough? Because it goes so fast. This moves faster than the pace of conferences or PDFs or regulation. I mean, how many of you here knew that we could do 100 images per second? Nobody, right? Because that's very new. It's a month or two old, actually. Oh, that's old. Yeah. Right, exactly. It's old, but it's this. But it's a fundamental reimagining of the way that you do media. We will have real-time video in the next few quarters. What are the implications of that? We are faster than human accurate speech. So we have to adapt. We have to do it. And it's difficult. Like, part of our growing thing as a company, we went big tech. We slowed down. And then we had to have a restructuring. We didn't use AI ourselves, so I can tell you all to use AI. Now we're using AI in all parts of our business, and we're shipping again. So it's difficult, but we have to do it, because otherwise, those of you that have graduates as kids or kids that are going to graduate, what is their jobs of the future? It has to have this technology as part of it, and governments have to build the infrastructure for the next generation. I think that's national models, national data sets enabling this. And again, open will pretty much be necessary for all those nationalized, uh, individuated data, yeah. data models. Yeah, well, like the German government isn't going to run on a closed source model, black box from you know, right, Cupertino. Right, 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 right. And then open as well is safer because you know what's inside it. This is the EU interpretability thing. You don't want to talk about anthrax, don't teach it about anthrax, well, you know? Well, the, so on the one hand, you see a lot of jobs going away, but on the other hand, you see a kind of global leveling where you seem to believe that a lot of the world's least privileged, most impoverished people could potentially find a very rapid shift in their living conditions as this becomes available to them, which creates a kind of global economic leveling long term. Is that overstating it? I see a massive global economic boom in the global south because they will, just as they leapfrogged PCs to mobile and direct payments, they will leapfrog to amplified intelligence. Again, what happens when every single developer in India has a GPT-4 level AI on a smartphone and India stack with their identity? They'll build things to solve problems, and how are you going to compete against them at scale when it's this great leveler? So they will form finance and economic opportunity. Here in the West, we have to think about deflation. We have to think about the knowledge economy that we have and the reordering of that and the media economy, and we have to do it fast. Okay. You see what I mean? The guy makes some big statements. But um, I, I want to just ask, you, you say 10% of your equity is in a nonprofit. And I know, you know, Salesforce always bragged about 111, 1%, right? Which was better than everybody else. So that's a pretty great, cool, cool thing. But you're also, I don't know whether it's coming through that same conduit, but you're making some investments in democracy, right? Because you're worried about that. Let's quickly end by talking about what you're worried about and what you're doing to try to help the research on that. Yeah, so we've given 18 million supercomputer hours since our inception into um, kind of open source research, including identification of this technology. Research into disinformation and electrical Everything, interference, yeah. and now that kind of thing. And now we're putting together something super directed because you have to have massively quick turnaround to build the technologies that will identify, edit, and stop the spread of misinformation and protect us all. And again, I think open is the way to do that. So, so should we be worried about all the elections happening in the world this year because of AI in particular? 100%. And we should move quickly 100%. to do something about it because it's not going to stop. It's a one-way door. Well, we should be worried, but you're doing a little bit about it. So thank you for everything you're doing on that. And uh, pretty, pretty cool stuff. Okay. <laughs>